seated. You may be seated. And uh, just to try to keep a flow of things, let's do this uh, first. And I want to read a passage of scripture and then have a word of prayer. And I want to keep this, this message flowing. So I believe that this is the word of God. I believe this is the word of God. I believe every word of God is true. I believe every word of God is true. Because it's impossible for God to lie. Now, tonight in the evening service, we'll go back to Revelation 21 in our study that we've been doing, uh, but this morning, being Memorial Day, we want to focus on that, and so the message is tailored for that, and uh, so if, uh, if Andy would make his way uh, toward the pulpit, I want to give you a verse of scripture, and then I want him to pray, uh, no, I'll pray, and then I want to read another verse of scripture to you, and then have Andy uh, you know, talk about his, his cousin a little bit. The title of the message is All Gave Some and Some Gave All. All Gave Some and Some Gave All. Uh, John 15, John chapter 15 and verse number 13 says, No greater love, uh, or greater love, I'm sorry, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father and God, we thank you for this time together. I pray that you'd bless your word, you'd bless this message, and you would move mightily, that you'd stir our hearts, convict our hearts, and move us into a deeper, greater commitment to you, and even a greater love for our nation. So, Father, thank you that we were born in America. Thank you that we are born in a free nation. Thank you for all the many blessings and things that we enjoy, that we take for granted. And truly, this is the reason why so many throughout the years have always wanted to come here. Uh, even my great-grandparents came here from Italy. Why? Searching for something better, searching for true freedom and light. And so, God, we've always been that beacon. I pray we don't lose that light. We would continue to be that beacon of hope for all the downcast and the downtrodden. But, God, we're living in desperate times where we've forgotten about our own. Our vets have, have suffered homelessly and even been forced to move so it could make room for illegal immigrants. That I don't understand. Father, our nation has ignored your principles, has thrown out the Bible, threw God out of school and out of the court system, and pretty much everywhere your name is spoken. It, it is spoken with ridicule and spoken against, and the people that speak your name are, are persecuted. Father, this stuff may happen, but you're still on the throne. And Father, we believe that you could send a great revival and that you could move in a mighty way, which we have never seen before. But you want your people to be of a right heart before you make that move. That's what you tell us in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will heal, forgive their sin and heal their land. And so, Father, we pray for that move within our hearts. Please, God, may we seek you more diligently and love you more deeply. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. As, G as uh, uh, Andy comes toward the pulpit, I basically have this message broken up into three groups, those who died in the service, those who died serving the Lord, and the one who died to save all. And so that's what we want to look at this morning. Right before uh, Andy comes and gives his testimony, I just want to read uh, to you the, the, the verses for the first point, those who died in the service. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse number 4, the word of God tells us, And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. These are the people in the Israeli army. They're fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And that news just broke David's heart. And it caused him to write uh, a, 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 a psalm of honor to them. Uh, verse 17 through 19, it says, And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Also, he bade them 
teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. Now, how are the mighty falling? How? It's not so much a question of how, but a question of brokenness. Oh, how the mighty are falling. His friends, even Saul, who sought to kill him, yet he honored him because he was God's chosen king, even though he sought to kill David, and even though he didn't live for the Lord. His heart breaks as he cries, how are the mighty falling? You drop down to 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse number 23 and 27. Forgive me if I gave you the wrong verses. Uh, Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. All of our vets that have fallen in battle have been just like this. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Amen. Amen. He goes on, he says, You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and other delights, who put an ornament of gold upon your apparel. This is true of us today. We should weep. The daughters of America, the sons of America, should weep over the souls of them that have died. They, they who have shed their blood, they have clothed us with the blessings that we have today. Amen. And then he says in verse 25, again, how are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O oh, Jonathan, thou wast slain in thy high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. And many men left dearly loved a uh, band of brothers. Uh, the military is a band of brothers. There's no other way you can explain it. And many men had to leave a person that was deeply close to them behind. They had to witness the death of someone that they loved dearly. And there was nothing they could do about it. They had to stand there as their guts lay all over the place and the person is screaming in agony and crying for his mom. Don't ever make fun of that. Don't ever make fun of that. Just longing to be anywhere else but there. And the battle rages and the firefight is going on and there's sparks and there's noise and there's fire and there's explosion and there's great confusion. And that's why they train you, they train you to be able to do, uh, to move without thinking. You don't have time to think. You don't. I, I think what I'm saying is something only us guys in the military can understand. But I hope that if you weren't, you would try. Try to understand the confusion. Try to understand that the vets that didn't perish, what they're carrying in their heart. This PTSD, if I'm not saying that right, this post-traumatic, that's a real thing. And real men, even so many years after the Vietnam War, are still living with memories they wish that they could take. They wish they could take their brain out and put it in solution and clean it and put it back in. But unfortunately, the scars of war are still there. And David weeps for his great friend Jonathan, who had died. And he closes with saying, How are the mighty fallen? And the weapons of war perished. Now, the weapons of war, he's not talking about the bows, the arrows, and all this. He's talking about the men. The men are what makes the weapons of war work. You can put a gun in anybody's hand, a rifle in anybody's hand. It doesn't mean they know how to use it. It doesn't mean that they can, can fire it. The weapons of war are the men who fight the war. Amen? I, I, Andy, if you come and, and, and tell us about, about your cousin, who, by the way, looks his picture's on the back of the book, looks a lot like your son, Joe, Joe who's named after him. Unbelievable. All right. Well, I thank you uh, for the opportunity, Pastor. Um, and I can't help but today think of uh, Pam and Mo when they mm. used to come here. Uh, Pam having lost her son and uh, a more very recent wound and more open wound than what I'm going to tell you. Uh, what I would like to say, first of all, is that I know I've told you about this before, so I'll 
keep it brief and try to do something a little different than what I've done in the past. But two things I like to come out of this testimony. One, of course, is to remember my, my relative. But the most important thing is I want you to, I want you to see what God has done for me um, through this. Uh, I had never heard of my relative. Now, now Joe DeCasati was the son of my grandfather's brother, if you can follow that. So he was my dad's cousin. Never heard his name spoken in the first 28 years of my life. Didn't know nothing about him, didn't even know he existed. Uh, one day doing research up in, in Hartford, Connecticut, I came across, well, I went up there with a friend, and my friend came across a name. It said, Joseph DeCasati killed in action over Germany. And he called me over to the card file and said, this is your relative. You didn't tell me you lost a relative in World War II. I said, I didn't. Well, one of the good things about having a name like Tikasati is if somebody has that name up there where you come from, you got to be related somehow. <laughs> so I knew we were related. Now, the bad thing about having that name is that it took me till the fourth grade to learn how to spell it. <laughs> but the, the, the thing is I knew, I knew that somehow this, this, this fellow was related to me. And within, within an hour, I had made the trip from Hartford down to New Haven to his grave. And there was his grave, and it was all covered in grass and mud, and nobody had been there for years. And uh, I'd asked my dad, how come you never mentioned your, your, your cousin to me? And he said, well, you know, it was a sad situation, and we didn't talk about it. That seems to be what Italians do. Yeah. Um, but be it as it may, Joseph was the son of Italian immigrants. Uh, he was the youngest son um, of Emilio and, and uh, Anna Di Casati. And um, Joe had an older brother named Frank. And uh, they grew up in the Italian section in New Haven. Joe was a Boy Scout. He was uh, attended church. Uh, he was all around. Good kid from what I can, can gather. And uh, when the war came along, he wanted to go into one of the service academies, but he couldn't get in. So uh, he joined the Army Air Force, and he was what you would call a radio operator gunner. His job was to monitor radio transmissions on the airplane and, if needed, man a machine gun. So he trained for quite a while. Um, he entered the Army in 1942, late 42, like in December. Um, they called him up for training in May of 43, and I would say he didn't enter combat until February of 1945. That's how long they took to train him. Radio school takes a long time. You got to learn Morse code. You got to be able to flash signals with lights and do all this stuff. And by the time Joe was flying, the German Air Force was kind of weak. They weren't really much to speak of, they had uh, been pretty much destroyed by this time. So uh, Joe flew his first combat mission out of England in um, March 8th, 1945. And uh, they uh, bombed a, a railroad facility and it was an easy mission. They went up, they came back, it was nothing. But you gotta understand life Life during, during World War II in a bomber plane was very difficult. You had to wear an electrically heated suit. You had to have an oxygen bent mask. You could die from any numbers of causes. You can, uh, oxygen bottles would freeze up and the guys wouldn't know it. And all of a sudden they would just pass out and they could die of anoxia. Um, your plane can have a mechanical malfunction and you're gone. And the bad thing about flying is when you're 20,000 feet in the air, when the plane goes down, you have some time to think about it before you, you get to the ground. So it wasn't totally safe when he was flying, obviously. It was still a war going on. Germans still had anti-aircraft artillery. Well, Joe flew his, he flew six missions, went up, came back, made it fine. Now, while he's flying, he's one of a big bunch of other guys, and he's watching other planes go down because the Germans are shooting at them as they fly over. Other planes are being hit. People are being killed. And uh, they, one of the crew members I met from Joe's crew talks about seeing a plane flying next to them just suddenly get hit in the middle by a piece of uh, German artillery. 
hit the bombs in the bomb bay and the whole plane melted and fell apart. So um, it was still very dangerous. And one day in March, I guess it was late March, March 30th, they took off to bomb the German uh, submarine pens at Wilhelmshaven, Germany. And uh, the flight deck of a B-24 is very crowded. It, think of a car, think of a passenger car, your sedan or whatever you drive. The driver, the passenger. All right, in the B-24 you have the pilot, the co-pilot. And right behind the co-pilot is Cousin Joe on the radio, sitting at the radio table. And behind him is the top turret gunner, working the guns on the top of the airplane. And between the pilots and the top turret gunner is the engineer standing there, watching the gauges on the airplane dashboard to make sure everything's running as it should. And uh, that's what, five people in a space maybe no bigger than this. And uh, as they flew along, they came across the coast of Germany. They flew over some small islands. And three German guns fired three shots. And they went off right next to the plane. Boom, boom, boom. The plane was rocked. And somebody saw hydraulic fluid on the floor that looks like blood because hydraulic fluid is red. So they, they yelled up, is somebody hit? And as one guy turned around, he saw my cousin just stutter and then fall back. And all those people on that flight deck, a little piece of flak about that big, came through the skin of the airplane and went through his arm into his chest and killed him instantly. Um, he left behind a broken home. His mother and father divorced. His older brother uh, was mentally unstable. It was just a bad situation all the way around. And I knew none of this. And I and in 30 years, it took me 30 years to write this book. In 30 years, every time I needed some information, I would go to the Lord and say, Lord, I this really means something to me. I really want to I really want to know X or Y. And the Lord would bring me the information, and I would get it. And um, I have to say that even though he died in 45, and I wasn't born until 62, <clears throat> when I saw his face for the first time in, in a photo that my dad got for me, um, I realized that he didn't have a chance to do much of anything. You know, I already had a family, I had children. He didn't have a chance to do that. And then you stop and think about all the other guys. Um, and I see their faces every day because I work in a business that deals with military history. And we all complain about our aches and our pains and our problems, and, but at least we're here to experience them. We're here to live, to love, and gain heaven. So I, I, I just wanted to say this morning that the pastor said any dummy could write a book. <laughs> I've proved it. Um, the, the, everything in here, if it wasn't for God, this book would be, it'd be empty. It'd be, it'd be 112 empty pages. Right? Now I believe that God loves us, and what's important to us is important to God. Amen. Okay? And I, I don't know Joe's spiritual capacity. I know that he believed that Jesus was the Christ because when he was killed, he had a little prayer book on the radio operator's desk with him that he would pray out of and read. And he'd go to services before he went up for a mission. So I hope he's with the Lord. But I think that the giving of oneself for the common good is, like the pastor said, is one of the noblest things that anyone could do. And I think that it pleases God. It's self-sacrifice. That's what Christ did for us. And that's one of the things I learned doing this book. I would think, wow, you know, 
he did this and he did that and blah, blah, blah. And then I read about other guys and you come right down to it. The bottom line is Christ did it first. You know, he did it for us. Amen. You know, and all these guys who come along who served in the military and are killed, whether they wanted to or not, nobody wants to die. But they gave of themselves for the common good, for the public good, you know. And that's, I think, what makes the day special, what makes the day holy. Paul says, think on things that are beautiful, think on things that are virtuous, think on things that are holy. To me, in a way, someone, remembering someone who sacrificed their life for the common good is one of those things to think on. And so I don't want to bore you with more details, but I mean, that, that's... I wanted this to give God the glory because, like I said, everything I wanted to know, he gave me. And I had nothing. I had nothing. And God gave me the book that Joe had the day he was killed. I got it from one of the crew members' families. You know, it, it, what I want to do is I want to share this book with everyone here at the church. So it's free to you guys. I'm going to leave a stack on the back. Feel free to take one. If Uncle George or Uncle Freddie might be interested, take one for him too. There's plenty to go around. Um, and uh, I just thank you for the opportunity. I, I know that I didn't give you a lot about Joe's background. or that. I don't know. He didn't, none of his letters survive. I don't know anything about what he felt or what he thought. Everything was gone when his family, his mother died, a pauper. His father left the mother, my uncle. He left the mother, and he died and had no, no contact with anybody. And Joe's older brother ended up in a uh, mental institution from 1945 till the day he died in 1993. So that's just one life. Okay? That's just one life, one person, one small slice. And go out to the National Cemetery and take a look at the National Cemetery and think that one slice and then let your eyes take in all the other headstones. And there's all those stories, all those people. So I, I didn't want this just to be about my relative. I wanted it to be about everyone. So I don't want to take up too much time. I, but I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity and... and uh, God bless and thank you. Amen. Yeah, while I was going through Andy's book, I Lord just touched my heart. Let Andy give a testimony. Let him come and talk about you know what happened. And I'm glad that he did because it brings light to what we're looking at. <coughs> I'll alter the message a little uh, here, but. Um, those who died in service of our country are men and women who gave their life defending our freedom. And so somebody might ask, well, why, why, why would they do that? And the first thing that comes to my mind is that they had a great love for their country. That's why they did it. From the Revolutionary War before they even really had a country to today, people do this for love of their country. Some people would argue, yeah, but they had, they, they had, they, they were drafted. They, they didn't have a choice. They had to go. Uh, in a lot of these wars, they went willingly. Amen. And I want to remind you of something that I think is a disgrace to this day, and that's during Vietnam War. There was a number of people that went to Canada. Why? They didn't love our country. Amen. They didn't stand with our country, and I still have a sour taste in my mouth for everybody that ran because of these guys right here. They stood up as men and they took it while these guys ran to Canada. Shame on you. Amen. To me, it's a shame that can never go away. You don't have to agree with it, but your country called you for a purpose. And instead of answering the call, you sat down like fighters in a boxing ring. The bell rings, but you don't come out of the corner. That's cowardice, amen? That's cowardice. They had a love. They had a great love for their country. 
They had a commitment to the call of duty. A person is going to enjoy the benefits, if, if a person is going to enjoy the benefits of living in our country, then they should be also willing to serve our country. Amen? If they want to take all these illegal immigrants into our nation at an incredible amount of numbers, then they ought to force at least a segment of them into the service of this country. If you're coming here and enjoying the benefits of the country, then you need to be willing to fight for that country. Amen? They had a commitment to the call of duty. Duty called, and they responded. Nobody says anything about the Korean War. That was just as important as any other war that we fought. And those men responded to the call of duty. Amen? They didn't cut and run. They responded to the call of duty. There was a conviction that our country was worth fighting for. Amen? They did what they did because of a conviction that our country was worth fighting for. And this is where I have to try to rein myself in. But why should I rein myself in? People tell me, people come to me, and they know my opinion that I, I am very, very angry with anyone who takes a knee during the national anthem. I am extremely angry with anyone who would burn our flag. Amen? And people come to me, but don't you understand, Bob, that's all part of the right of, of being American. We got the right to do things. Just because you right, got the right to do things, it doesn't make it right to do it, amen? And, and it's a disgrace, because when you burn the flag, you, you disgrace these men that died under that flag. I don't care who they are. You disgrace those men. And, all, and you're spitting in the face of all the men that served and survived. And that's ridiculous. I've got the right. No, no, you have the right to a peaceful protest. I'll give you that. But you cross the bounds. You, you step over the line when you burn the flag or take a knee during the national anthem. Because that very thing you're spitting on and burning on is giving you the right to stand there and do it. So you ought to show some respect. But we live in a country where there's a lack of a conviction that our country is worth fighting for. And all these liberals, all these liberals are big mouth talkers, I want to tell you. Because if push come to shove and they had to fight, they would run. They would run. So a conviction that our country's worth fighting for. That's why these men did what they did. They died in the service of our nation. They, stopped, they died with the principle of freedom, being able to live on beyond their generation. They died with a hope of a better America. Yeah, World War II, America had problems. You know, there was a problem. I understand the, the, the black man was oppressed in that day. There was stuff that he couldn't do, amen, that needed to be changed. And this, this, despite what the woke people say today, it did change. It changed drastically. Yeah, it took the civil rights movement in the 1960s. But I want to tell you, from 1960 to 2023, the black man has had every opportunity and not denied, amen? I believe that. I believe, we, you, how many, we had a black president. We now have a black vice president. How many senators, mayors, governors ha are black? So don't tell me you don't have the same privilege. You don't have the same chance in this it's the systemic racism, and I'm oppressed. Let me enlighten you with a fact here. When you go by, by, uh, by statistics, by percentage, when you go by percentage, I'm going to tell you, there's a group of, of people that are highly educated. They're the highest percentage of this group that's highly educated. The highest percentage of this group that I'm going to tell you about in just a moment has the highest percentage of graduating their children from college. They have the highest percentage of the best paying jobs. They also have the highest percentage of the family unit staying together. Now who is that? It's the Asian community. The Asian community is the highest percentage per capita. So does that mean that there's systemic racism of, of, uh, of, of Orientals against whites? They have the last amount of people in prison. 
Does that mean there's systemic racism by Asians against whites? No, you would think that it's foolish. Well, it's foolish to say that there's systemic racism of whites against blacks. And they try to use the same figures. Well, there's more whites that have better paying jobs and graduate. Don't play that card, amen? Because the statistics show that it's not what you're trying to say it is. Of course, every country, our country has a lot of things that we can improve on. And we went backwards. But these men died hoping to give us a better country. Amen? And keeping us from becoming a country we don't want to be. And unfortunately, that's where we're headed fastly, becoming a country we don't want to be. And so here are these men who died in the service. Then quickly, I, I won't turn to the passage, but in Hebrews 11, verses 23 through 39, actually verses 35 through 39, you have where those who have died serving the Lord. I, I said I wasn't going to read it, but let me read it anyway, because those are important too. This Memorial Day, while we remember our fallen military, we also need to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ who have died serving the Lord. And if you look at, uh, uh, at Hebrews 11 and verse 32, it says, And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Japheth, of David also and Samuel uh, uh, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lying, quenching, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead back to life again. All right, that's all good stuff. Praise God for it. But this is also what happened. And others were tortured. And today... Others are being tortured for the belief in Jesus Christ throughout this world. Others were tortured, not accepting the deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings. Folks, the cruel mockings is already here in America. It's already being uh, talked about on television. And what people laugh at, people accept. That's the whole basis of situation comedy, right? To get you to see something differently. And if you laugh at Christians being mocked, then it becomes no big deal. And Christians are constantly being mocked in the media. It says, and others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain uh, with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Now notice what he says, of whom the world was not worthy. The world, this world was not worthy of the blood of all the saints that shed their blood. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they, which, uh, that they without us should not be made perfect. I ain't got the time to explain that. But what I wanted you to see there is Old Testament persecuted believers, New Testament persecuted believers. You can find their testimonies in Fox's Book of Martyr and the Trail of Blood of the books written by the voice of the martyrs as they talk about all kinds of people from small girls to adults that have been persecuted from pillar to post, girls that have been raped and forced into a sex trade industry, boys who have been raped and forced into slave markets, all this going on in the world in which we live. We're oblivious because we just see our own little box. We're only concerned with, with just our little thing. But these people are suffering torture and torment, being burned alive by Muslims, having their head cut off with a dull knife. We all remember not too long ago in Egypt when 21 Coptic Christians lost their head violently. Why? because they were Christians. That's the only reason why. People say, oh, well, well, look at all that, that, that happened in the Crusades. No, the Crusades was a war between Muslims and the Catholic Church. The Crusades were Catholics. They weren't, they weren't representing biblical Christianity. They were Catholics. And even at that, the Communist Party has killed far more people than ever died in the Crusades. So we need to remember that when they want to criticize Christians. 
But we need to remember how many Christians have died. Why did they die? They died for the same reason these others died, for their country. They died for the Lord because they had a great love for the Lord. Does your Lord, do you love your Lord so much that you're willing to die for him? That's what he's looking for. He's looking for us to be willing to lay down our life. Not saying that we have to, but being willing if it does. What else did they have? They had a commitment to the gospel message. What's the gospel message? Death, burial, resurrection. Amen? They had a commitment to that message. They had a conviction that the Bible is the true word of God. And men need to hear and know the word of God at all costs. Therefore, they died carrying the gospel boldly to their own country, their own countrymen, and into foreign lands. And we need to remember that. We need to remember the sacrifice of those that have come before us. We have a Bible in our hand because of a trail of blood. A trail of blood of those that were burned at the stake for translating this word into English. This Bible was made the kindling in which they would burn a fire as the people were burnt. Even the great Tyndale was burned at the stake, chained and burned. Some of them, as they were dying, were singing praises to God. Some of them were still preaching the gospel as they were being burned, amen? But they didn't cut and run. They were strong, and they stood firm. And yet we sit there and debate, oh, should I tell this guy about Jesus? Oh, should I give him a tract? Oh, what if he don't like me? Oh, I'm trying to be his friend. Trying to be his friend. Paul says, have I become, you, become your enemy because I tell you the truth? People are telling us, oh, you need to be more tolerant. You, you, you need to win them over. No, no, no. You need to tell them the truth. And like Paul, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So if you're going to pay for it, and in this country very soon, we are going to pay for it. Amen? It's already happening in Canada. And it'll happen here when we say that this is the word of God. They say, come on, Bob, be realistic. Be realistic. How did you like to be running a bakery? Oh, this is your life business. This is your passion. This is what you do. And a gay couple comes in and says, we want you to make a, 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 a wedding cake. Now, there's all kinds of bakeries, right? But you say, no, we, we don't agree with that lifestyle. We refuse to make a cake for your wedding. Well, you got that right as an America? Not anymore. They lose their business. Outrageous fines. Courts. It's here, folks, but we got to be willing to be those people that will stand and not cut and run, not hide. Stand up and proclaim the gospel. This day reminds me of the fallen soldiers and servicemen, but it reminds me of the fallen Christians who have served the Lord faithfully. And then quickly, we'll be quickly with this, the one who died to save us all. Ultimately, the ultimate life, even when, when he's talking about that in, in John, uh, we're going to go to John 10, but let me read for you again John 15 where we started off. I want you to notice what he says there, John, uh, in John 15, 13, you go to John 10, I'm going to be right there in a moment. In John 15, 13, he says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, Ye are my friends. Amen? Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I commanded you. It is him, it is Jesus that is going to lay down his life. Now I want you to notice what the word of God says in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10 in verse number 11, there the word of God says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? Giveth his life for the sheep. Amen? Jesus gave his life not for his own purpose or his own cause, but for the sheep, that the sheep might be saved. He says in verse number 15 through 18, he says, As the Father knoweth me, even so knoweth I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Now when he's saying that, he's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking to Jews right there, and he's telling these Jews, I have other sheep that aren't of this fold. The other sheep are the Gentiles that will believe on him after the, 
the death, burial, and the resurrection. He says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Have you heard the voice of Jesus? I want to tell you, if you're saved here this morning, it's because you heard the voice of Jesus. It might not have been an audible voice, but there was a conviction on your heart. There was a drawing of your soul. It was God Almighty, amen? And you responded and became one of the sheep in his fold where he is the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd. It says in verse 17, Therefore doth my father love me. Why? Because I lay down my life that I may take it again. I'm going to lay down my life. I am going to die, but I'm going to rise again. I take it again. Three days later, he took it again. No man taketh it from me. It was an argument one time in the break room. I didn't want anything to do with it, minding my own business, and I'm grabbed. Bob, who do you think killed Jesus? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? I said it was everybody. He died for the sins of all the world. And I told him this verse, no man taketh it from me. Nobody killed him. He laid it down himself of his own free will. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He died on his terms, amen? He didn't, he didn't die till he said it is finished. Finished what? Finished paying the penalty for my sin. All of my sin, past, present, and future, all put on Christ. And he died. And he was buried. And three days later, he rose victoriously in a tomb, or from a tomb. Amen? I want you to look at 1 John, 1 John 3.16. We're all familiar with John 3.16, but look at 1 John 3.16, which is an interesting study looking at all the 3.16s. But in 1 John 3.16, the Word of God says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, Listen, you don't have to question whether God loves me. You just have to believe it. Amen? He loves you. Amen? And so he says here, he, he, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. There's the evidence of his love. It's not in whether or not he gives you a BMW or a Mercedes or a big house. That doesn't mean anything. He gave his life for you. The only religious leader to give his life for his people is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells us here, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought, ought, uh, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That means I need to be willing to die for you, because he died for me. And one last set of verses, and, and then we'll close. In Romans chapter 5, book of Romans, I love the book of Romans. It's not always an easy book to teach, but I love it. Amen. I understand it when I read it, but trying to teach it sometimes it may be difficult. But it's the greatest book on salvation ever written. Amen. The greatest book ever written on salvation. Verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, being justified, declared righteous, how? By faith. Not by works, not by doing, but by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then drop down to verse number 15. Verse 15 says, but not as uh, Romans 5, 6, verse 6. I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong set of verses. Romans 5 and verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who did he die for? The righteous man? The good guy? No, he died for the ungodly. I'm glad he did so because that's what I am. He says here in verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Scarcely for a righteous or for a good guy, somebody might give their life for them, but, you know, scarcely. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. You see that? Some would even dare to die. 
But God commendeth, he demonstrated his love, he commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? While I was a sinner, Christ died for me. While I was captured in the grips of sin, while I was out uh, partying and drinking and doing all this junk and perfecting my sinful abilities, growing deeper in my sin, growing farther away from God, saying, I don't need that. I don't want that. Oh, sin was swallowing me up. I was swimming in it and I was loving it. Amen? And in that condition, Christ yet died for me. He didn't say, Bob, I need you to get better. He didn't say, Bob, listen, you got to quit this drinking or I can't save you. God, Bob, you got to quit this smoking dope or I can't save you. Bob, you got to quit this fooling around or, or I can't save you. Thank God he didn't say any of that. He said, Come on to me, all you that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon, upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when I was confronted with the fact that I was a sinner, that bound to go to a devil's hell, and I came to the realization that Christ Jesus died on the cross for my sin and rose again the third day, and all I had to do was trust him. Say, God, I'm unworthy. I'm a sinner. I'm sinful. Please forgive me of my sin." Cleanse me from my, this unrighteousness. He saved me. Amen. He made me born again. Not waiting for me to get better. The saddest thing, I got saved in the military, okay? Early on in the military. This is the saddest thing for me when it comes to Memorial Day. People don't go to heaven because they die for their country. That's not a free pass. You died for your country, oh, you get to go to heaven. George, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but George used to tell me the story about when he was a firefighter before he was saved. He thought, man, that would be a glorious thing to die in a, in, in a fire, be a noted hero. But you know what? Had, he di had George died in the fire, he would have opened his eyes in a greater fire. He'd have been in the fires of hell, burning forever and ever. Did it matter that he risked his life to save others and he died in that? He would have died and went to hell. And many of these men that had died on the battlefield in the most hellish thing on earth you could imagine to close their eyes and open them in greater pain than they were just a few seconds ago and greater torment and greater horror because they did not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that's what breaks my heart. Because I have to wonder when I see all the names that are written on the Vietnam Wall, are they written in the Book of Life? Wow. See, it's your and my responsibility that everybody knows. Amen. I don't know if this still happens, but when I went to boot camp, there was a man there with a box of little Bibles, little Gideon Bibles, and he gave me one. And I had that thing for a long, long time. I don't know where it is now, but I had it for a long, long time. Soldiers need those Gideon Bibles. Why? Because they need to know Christ as their Savior. Amen. And if they put it right here in their pocket, like I got this notebook, it just might save their life on the battlefield. You never know. Weird things happen. But they need to know Christ. Or they're not going to make it. That's why we support Mike Farris, who trains chaplains to win the military personnel to Jesus Christ. They need to hear the gospel. We need to be willing to go. We need, as good citizens of the United States of America, we need number one, we, 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 well, not number one, because I've got this order in reverse, but we need to have a willingness to serve our country and die in the cause, if it may be. Number two, and really this should have been number one, we should have been willing to serve our Lord and get the gospel message out, no matter what it costs us, amen? Get the gospel out because people are dying and they're going to hell. And number three, we need to be fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ who died a horrible death on an old rugged cross but didn't stay dead. He rose again, proving that 
God has forgiven us of our sin, proven that we have a, a future resurrection of our own, proven that there is a, a, a home in heaven, but also proven there's a judgment to come. And we need to be his mouthpiece to take that message everywhere. No greater love hath any man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he called those apostles around him friends. He was saying, I'm going to lay down my life for you. And today he says, I laid down my life for you. Will you use your life for me? Amen. Will you use your life for me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father and God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the holy word of God. And we thank you, God, for the men and the women who died in service for our nation. And we can only pray that they knew you as Lord and Savior. And we pray for those that have lost loved ones in the military. We pray that, that God, you would please comfort the grieving hearts even now. Comfort their hearts as they grieve over loved ones that have perished. But Lord, we pray for those that are serving in the military now. That you would help them. You would open their heart and their mind and their eyes. You would draw them to yourself that they might be saved. And save people that are in the military would share the gospel with those with them that they might be saved, that they might know Christ as their Savior and give their life to you. I thank you for Bubba Ross and so many others that reached out and, and witnessed to me that I would come to know Christ as my Savior. Father, there's somebody out there today that needs a Bubba Ross. Please, Father, raise them up to share the gospel with those in the military that are lost. And help us, God, to love you with our whole heart, with a full commitment, with a willingness to go where you want us to go, do what you want us to do, say what you want us to say, dear Lord. Oh, God, please, may we be that people that is pleasing, well-pleasing to you, a sweet-smelling savor to your nostrils. God, may we be those people. And may we not fear the world. May we not fear the world the flesh, or the devil, but our allegiance be to you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. All right, Jeremy, if you'll come and lead us in the hymn of invitation, Cindy will play the piano for us, and we will uh, be singing our hymn. And uh, oh, what hymn number is it? 384, let's all stand as we sing. Him 384. Very However, God's touched your heart. Please move at this time. Amen. 